There is a topic called evidence-based design that has been around for several years. So a big question is why don't architects use evidence-based design for all their projects? It's, it's a legitimate question. Well, there are several answers and um, I would like to discuss some of those answers. Uh, first is uh, the very simple answer that um, architects don't learn evidence-based design. They have to become interested in it uh, on their own and then uh, do research on it. It's not the standard um, a part of architectural education. Uh, and um, uh, the evidence for evidence-based design really comes from outside architecture. So it is, uh, it is easy for architects to be suspicious of something coming from outside architecture. I have already um, discussed consilience and the join between two disciplines. Well, architecture has, uh, since uh, the last century, for about 100 years, uh, isolated itself from other disciplines. It has almost zero uh, consilience. And, uh, well, you can uh, accuse uh, architecture as a discipline of, of deliberately isolating itself in order to preserve uh, internal power uh, and play games. Uh, prevent threats from the outside from uh, getting into into uh, the discipline. Uh, however, however, you you dis, you uh, explain it. Uh, architecture is insular, so it is difficult uh, for um, uh, topics and results that are very relevant to design to uh, to enter the discipline from the outside. So so uh, this is a, this is the syndrome of not invent, not invented here. And it's not only with architecture, it, it, uh, it, it, um, it, has, it can be seen in all endeavors, uh, in commerce and, um, and in everything else. So there is a suspicious uh, or something coming from the outside. Um, uh, mostly, um, we would like to, uh, to extend the common information base of architecture by deriving and generating results from inside architecture. And this is what this course tries to do. This course uh, tries to uh, um, introduce a scientific way of thinking, the scientific method into architecture, so that my students in this course are going to generate uh, results um, and, and theory from observations and measurements within architecture, so that, that uh, the, the original objection that I mentioned uh, two minutes ago uh, is, is no longer valid, and uh, um, these results will be, uh, I think, easier psychologically uh, to, accept, to accept, and there will not be uh, this, this uh, not invented here syndrome uh, that prevents um, uh, very useful information uh, from coming in. So, um, going back uh, to, uh, to science, there is scientific theory, biology, physics, chemistry, and there is scientific experiment. Now, when students take science, they take science lab, right? They take chemistry lab, physics lab, biology lab, and they do simple experiments. Why do they do that? They're not discovering science, but they're doing simple experiments to re-derive basic results of science. If you're there and you're doing a simple experiment as a student and you gather the data and then you put the data together and you add it, you, you divide it, you manipulate it, and you get the result, okay? You get the result and you have re-derived in a very simple way a theory that, uh, say, in physics or chemistry or biology, that has been known for hundreds of years, but you have re-derived it. It is a fantastic learning experience. The same thing does not exist in architecture, but since this course is introducing theory into architecture, it also has to go hand in hand with introducing the sort of the architecture theory lab. And that's what we're going to do. So what is the architecture theory lab? Uh, we are going to measure the complexity of a form language. So I have the downloadable uh, uh, form language uh, a list, a checklist that anyone, any, anyone who's looking to this video I uh, can look at, uh, uh, at the bottom of the links and download uh, this form. Uh, fill it out as best as you can. There is a second document uh, called the, uh, the Regional Adaptivity Index with, with instructions uh, on how to, to compute both measures. 
you know, and go ahead and do it and, and see the numbers you get. So uh, these, are, these are very simple estimates, and then you do um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, complexity uh, measure for the form language is, is as soon as you complete that list, then you just run it in Microsoft Word and you do the word count. That's it, the word count. 200 words, it's a very short list. 570 words, it's slightly longer. 1,000 words, well, it's longer still. The, the, the more words you have, the more complex the form language is. Now, is this accurate? No, but look, we're beginning. We're beginning to create theory. There are many other factors, but you know, one thing at a time, this is really a, a baby theory. Uh, but, but compared to zero, it is a phenomenal step forward. So uh, let's not, uh, let's not uh, um, uh, uh, criticize it. Uh, the, the other index is the, is the um, uh, um, regional adaptivity index, which you can also estimate, and it comes out to be a percentage from zero to 100 percent. And uh, I describe how to, how to do that just by very simple measurements. So you pick your form language and uh, you compute some percentage, 73 percent, for, uh, for your uh, regional adaptivity index, and that's it. So those are two numbers then we are going to, to use and combine, and my students are going to plot them, or rather, my students are going to derive. Each one will give me one set of these numbers, okay? A pair of numbers, and then I will plot them all together for all the students in the class in a, in a plot, and I will see if that plot makes any sense. Does it have a correlation? Now, I strongly suspect that there will be some vaguely linear correlation of adaptivity uh, related to the complexity of a form language. So, we'll see. And, uh, and uh, so, everyone uh, uh, who is listening to this lecture can perform the same experiment. And uh, we'll see what happens. Can we make architecture into a numerate principle? Namely, uh, get architects interested in measuring numbers, playing with numbers, using numbers in um, their buildings, uh, estimating quantities, comparing quantities. Uh, so far, uh, numbers exist only in construction science, where you can measure things. Well, I'm trying to, in this course, I'm trying to uh, introduce a whole new way of thinking in architecture where um, we uh, use numbers in uh, the design itself, in the aesthetic part of the design. So this is motivated by the uh, tremendous impact that different aspects of design have on human health and human well-being. So that is recent results. Those are recent results coming from uh, medicine and the neuroscience, uh, environmental studies, direct uh, studies. So uh, we need to be able to adjust designs in order to accommodate those findings. So this is totally new stuff. This is innovative stuff. But yet, uh, we see the results. So an architect who's interested and actually reads those studies, which are outside uh, architectural academia, which tends to ignore such uh, important studies, say an architect discovers those studies and wants to create a more adapted design. Well, they need some sort of measure. They need numbers to see if they're uh, designs uh, are going to be better according to uh, to the to the uh, measured um, uh, health qualities. Well, we are creating that uh, th that model does not exist so far. So I'm introducing some uh, uh, qualities that can be measured uh, before any discipline can be made into a scientific one. It has to identify the right parameters, the variables, the qualities to measure. Now, some qualities can be measured, for example, the, uh, the form language, you can measure the complexity using a s software, or you can count it by hand, okay, so you get a number. Uh, another number that I'm introducing this week uh, is the uh, adaptivity, the regional adaptivity index. And uh, so here, here is the essence. We don't use software. Uh, we use the human mind to estimate. So how can you es estimate the regional adaptivity? Well, I'm giving the model and it's described, you know, below here, you, you can download uh, that form and see it. Suppose we have, uh, is this design or in general, a form language adaptive to children's needs? If it's not, you give a zero. 
If it is adaptive to children's needs, that's obviously true, then you give a two. If you can't decide, or if it's so-so, you give a one. So, zero, one, or two. Nothing can be easier than that. Does this have value? Well, you know, it sounds like it's, it's a very a vague estimate, but it is a very powerful estimate when combined with other estimates. So uh, the original adaptivity index that I have defined has five geographical estimates. Okay, one is, uh, does the building or the form language use local materials? Give a two. Does it use global imported materials? Which is a zero, right? If it's half and half, or you can decide, you give a one. So again, zero, one, two. Uh, so uh, I have defined uh, five qualities for a geographical adaptation, and then five separate qualities for human adaptation. Add those up independently, so you have geographical qualities and also human adaptive qualities, and then you multiply those together. You have a total of 10 on the one side and a total of 10 on the other side, and you multiply them and you get a total out of 100. That's beautiful. That's a percentage. So you get a percentage, okay? 63%. Um, does that have any meaning? Well, you see, yes, when you start looking and actually comparing, you see that that percentage has a tremendous uh, um, uh, uh, meaning because it, it really captures in a very, very simple way. It captures the adaptivity of either a, an individual design or a form language that's used for, uh, for many different designs uh, in that region. So there you have something that arose almost out of nothing. Well, okay, this, this method of thinking, which is, of course, totally new to architects, but it's also new to, to, to mathematicians. It's, this comes from physics, okay? Physicists have to deal with very, very complex problems, and they refuse to give up. So when dealing with a very complex problem, physicists make a very toy-like estimate. And it works because you get the first handle onto a, a, a complex uh, process and then uh, you can improve it later, but, but uh, you refuse to give up. Okay, so, so you make simple estimates like this and that's how the first models are created. Now, once the first models are created, then you open the field up to some wonderful um, uh, possibilities. Because once you have several different quantities that represent architectural variables that are important for, for the user's health, okay, then you can correlate those variables. Namely, you can plot them. You know, this is grade school mathematics. You, you know, make a plot, y against x. But when you see that plot, if there is a correlation, when you see that plot, Wow, that's it's a, it's a phenomenal uh, uh, information that you're getting. You're seeing something, okay? The data is giving you insight that you cannot possibly uh, obtain otherwise. So, um, first of all, you learn something yourself from what's happening, and then, more important, uh, you can show such a plot to a client or to decision makers, and you say, "Listen, you know, my building is fantastic because of this." Blah 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 blah. You know, that's that's a usual. Uh, architects uh, uh, selling points, which which is a, a part of the trade. But then, you know, you can show a plot and you say, look, I'm backing this up by some estimates and here is the plot. So what I'm telling you is not just blah, blah, words. Uh, it is uh, it is backed by by these estimates. And these estimates are, 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 are spurred by um, uh, scientific work that has been done in the medical field, the neuroscience field, etc. So this is a very, very powerful tools that I'm introducing uh, into architecture in order to link the, um, uh, the medical data that has arisen only in the last several years with uh, qualities of design. So uh, when, we, when we start the, the process of, of making architecture into a numerate discipline, we also uh, open up the door to correlations uh, and graphs and, and combining the, the data into models, okay? The models are, 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 up to, are, are up to you, okay? I have made a few models that I'm going to be discussing and presenting in this course, but once, once the door is open, then anyone can, can make models and test them against the observations, okay? If they work when tested against the observations,
then it's a very valuable model. And uh, uh, okay, so you apply it and it has explanatory qualities and it has predictive qualities. That's the most important thing. So, so you can, on, in all honesty, stand before a client and present a graph that has predictive qualities. And you say, look, I predict that, you know, if you hire me to design this building and you build the building, it will have these positive qualities. That's a prediction. And you, you're backing it with data. Up until now, it's all blah, blah, blah. It's, it, is, it depends upon uh, the status, the media status of some architect. Uh, and most of the times, uh, that's, that's baloney. Uh, the actual building has terrible qualities. It, it, it was uh, just, just a, a, a self-promotion of, of famous architects. Okay, uh, how many times do we see that? Well, I think uh, it's, it's, it's a terrible failure uh, of, uh, of architecture because of the lack of what I'm talking about. So I want to introduce this and, uh, and, and, um, and give a tool to your average uh, practitioner uh, in order to uh, get a better product out there. Okay, so, so um, uh, we have a, a method of getting a better product.